to the recording now. Yes, the presentation will be on um, our website. <clears throat> so again, uh, Mr. Wilkesane, if you would like to start, go ahead. Are you, and you're unmuted, right? Yes, I am. Can you, okay. you can hear me? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Maureen. Uh, thank you for hosting this tonight and uh, pleasure for me to uh, be here with you again uh, for another year. Um, as Ms. Conway said, uh, the presentation, not only are we recording this presentation, but the presentation is going to be posted on the school's website. And the reason that I reiterate that is, is because I can guarantee you that although this is a, uh, a nice basic financial aid presentation, uh, I'm going to throw a lot of terms, I'm going to throw a lot of information your way. So I can guarantee that you're going to be overwhelmed. It's natural. Uh, don't feel weird about it. Uh, after you're done tonight, let this sink for a few days, go back and, you know, listen to the recording again, uh, review the presentation again. And what my hope is, is that as you're doing your financial aid forms, as you're receiving your financial aid awards in the spring, that hopefully some of this stuff stuck with you and, you know, kind of jars your memory and you're like, oh, okay, I remember Mr. Kassane talking about this. Okay. So again, don't, don't be worried because it is a lot of information. So what are we going to cover tonight? <clears throat> and I apologize, I'm getting over a little cold. So uh, what are we going to cover? We're going to cover the types and sources of aid, the application process, the financial aid package, and then other useful information. Uh, but before we start, I wanted to point this out. Every college and university in the United States is required to have what's called a net price calculator. Uh, basically, a net price calculator is, is a mini financial aid application, and it's located either uh, on a college's either admissions websites or on their financial aid websites. Okay, we have ours on our financial aid site. Uh, and what it is, is it's a mini application that you can complete. It should take you no more than three to five minutes to complete this. And what it does is it gives you an estimate uh, of individuals of, of first year students who meet your same criteria that you put into the application uh, are receiving an estimated financial aid during their first year there. Okay, so it kind of gives you an idea of people who meet your profile at that school, what they received in financial aid, what was their average uh, financial aid, okay? Uh, you know, traditionally the data is one or two years old, so you have to, you know, a lot for that. But what I usually recommend is as your sons and daughters, you know, kind of have it narrowed down to their top three colleges or perhaps their top five colleges, go out to the school's websites and find, you know, the net price calculator and take the time, the three to five minutes to complete the, you know, the little application and just see, you know, how generous or perhaps how, you know, cheap that school is uh, with their aid based on the profile that you submit. Okay, but it's a very useful tool. When you apply for financial aid, a uh, pretty important slide here. When you apply for financial aid, and we're going to go over the applications in the next section, your financial aid application is going to be sent to the sources of aid that you see on the left-hand side of your screen, okay? So that application is sent to the federal government, it is sent to the state of New Jersey, and it is sent to every college or university that you indicate on that form. What each one of those entities is doing is they will be evaluating you for the types of aid that you see on the right side of your screen. So for example, the federal government, state of New Jersey and the colleges and universities are gonna be evaluating you for eligibility for any grants, <clears throat> excuse me, any scholarships, student loans, and the potential for employment opportunities through the college work study program. So you're going to notice when I hit that section, that one FAFSA form, that free application for federal student aid is basically doing it all. All right. You don't have to worry about, you know, filling out 10 applications and doing all these, you know, different things. You're just going to fill out that form and you're going to be evaluated for the types of aid that you see on the right. The one anomaly that I want to point out is, and you see there on the left, it says not sent to outside scholarship entities. You're going to find that a lot of students are going to be applying for private scholarships, you know, whether it's through civic organizations or perhaps, you know, uh, you, know indivi you know, individual foundations or institutions or, you know, perhaps through your parents, employer, whatever, different sources, you know, they're going to be applying for private scholarships. A lot of those private scholarships do not require any financial aid information, okay? 
But those that do, they may request that the information that you completed on the FAFSA gets sent to them so that they can do their evaluation, okay? So what happens is when students apply for aid, you know, at the end of that processing, they're gonna receive in the same email address that they used when they applied, the results of the FAFSA, okay? It's called a SAR, Student Aid Report. And it gives students an opportunity to kind of review all the data they put in on the FAFSA, make sure they didn't make any mistakes, give them an opportunity to go back and correct it. But again, it's kind of like serves as your receipt, you know, of all the information that you completed on that form. So some outside scholarship entities may ask for that information. So all that a student would need to do is just forward that email to the scholarship entity. Okay. But again, that's, you know, far and few between. It is rare, but I at least wanted you to know that certain sources, again, that federal, state, and college is automatically going to get it. They're automatically going to evaluate you. But for those students who are applying for outside scholarships, some of them may request that data and you'll have to take that extra step in providing that information to them. I'm gonna go over a couple of different types of aid, okay? I'm gonna go over need-based aid, which is based on the information the family completes on the FAFSA, based on the household income, assets, things like that. I'm gonna go over some merit-based aid, which is gonna be based as the uh, you know, slide says there, merit-based, you know, your high school grades, you know, GPA, uh, AP classes, things like that. And then there's aid that is both need and merit, all right? So the first type of aid I wanna cover is federal aid. And again, you're filling out the financial aid form, the federal government is automatically receiving the form and they're gonna be evaluating you for these types of aid. So the federal government basically gives out what's called need-based aid mostly based on uh, income, you know, the household income on, that you supply on the form. Uh, their signature program is called the Federal Pell Grant. You can receive up to $6,495 per year in the Pell Grant. And I mean per year because, yes, every year you have to reapply for financial aid. Every year there's the potential that your household income could change or the family situation could change. And every year you would need to be reevaluated uh, for these types of aid. Okay, so the federal Pell Grant up to $64.95. There's another program called Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. Those are funds that the federal government gives each college and university. And then based on the results of that financial aid application, the college and university would determine if you qualify and for how much. And you see the amounts range there as high as 4,000. <clears> Students who are considering becoming teachers, uh, colleges and universities participate in the TEACH grant. That could be up to 4,000 per year. There's one program that's called the Federal College Work Study. That one varies. Uh, what happens in that case is, is if a student indicates they're interested in work study on the FAFSA, and you know they have, they have need and they qualify for work study, the college or university will award that student a certain amount of money. That amount varies because what that does is it allows the student to apply uh, for a job on campus. And what they would do is they work and they earn that award, okay? They get paid every two weeks, you know, like a normal job. And then that award uh, they're earning, they're chipping away at the award. And then that award is to assist them, you know, with educational expenses, whether it's, you know, indirect costs like, you know, room or, you know, uh, spending money, things like that. So again, Part of the financial aid application, the college would determine if the student qualifies, and it's basically an award that the student earns. So some of the, some of the federal programs. State of New Jersey has a lot of aid programs. And remember, the information is going to be sent to them, and you will be evaluated for these programs. Uh, in the state of New Jersey, the way the program works uh, are they have need-based programs, they have merit-based programs, and they have need and merit-based programs. So they really have a combination of everything. Unlike the federal, which is strictly need, uh, state of New Jersey has need and merit-based awards. As you see there, you know, there's a, a lot of programs, you know, the, uh, you see about 10 program names there on the left with varying annual awards. The signature program for the state of New Jersey is called the Tuition Aid Grant. It's that first award you see there on the left-hand side. And the annual awards for the Tuition Aid Grant vary greatly. They could go from as low as $1,244 per year to as high as $13,196 per year. 
And the way the state of New Jersey uh, works their awards is you must be a New Jersey resident attending a New Jersey school. So you see that, you know, how great those awards range, uh, you know, at the uh, New Jersey uh, programs. And that's because the type of institution that the student attends will also determine, you know, that award amount. So this 1244 is, is probably a community college award, while the 13196 is more of an independent college and university award. But you see a myriad of programs here with different amounts here. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over each one of these specifically. But what I want you to know is, and that's the reason why you know this presentation is gonna be posted and recorded, because you can actually refer back to this presentation and you can look at each specific award that is listed here. And it's going to give you for each award, whether it is a need-based grant and what the criteria for eligibility for this grant is. So again, you're going to be evaluated for each one when you apply for A, but each one of these has a corresponding slide that goes over in detail where there is need-based, where there is need and merit-based. For example, the Gus right here is one that's like that. What are the eligibility conditions? You know, on this one, you see rank top 5% of their class and must attain a 3.0 GPA. So each one of those awards has a corresponding slide. And it'll explain to you again, whether it's merit, need-based or a combination of both and what each of their criteria is, okay? So unfortunately I'm giving you homework at the very beginning of the presentation. So you're gonna have to, you know, come back and do some homework and refer to this but I at least wanted you to know that in the interest of time, I'm gonna you know, skip over some of these, but you can always go back and refer to each one of them to see if you would qualify for each type of aid that is available through the state of New Jersey, okay? Um, Ms. Conway, any questions yet or do you want me to continue? So far, I don't see any questions, so we'll okay. move you on. Perfect, thank you. Um, student loans. So. What I'm going to go over here are student loans that are in the student's name only, okay, and the parents are not involved yet at this point. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, you know, student loans have kind of like become a, a, a norm, you know. Uh, college uh, has gotten so expensive that student loans are kind of part of every student's, you know, academic uh, experience, you know, they, where they, they probably have to borrow on loans uh, sometime during their uh, academic career. So the loans that I'm gonna go over here are again, loans that are in the student's name only. Uh, there is no credit check on these loans. Uh, all students, regardless of income, will qualify for these types of student loans. And these are the types of loans that repayment on them will not begin until six months after they graduate from college. Okay, and that means whether it's for their undergrad and then from there they move on to graduate school or law school or medical school or whatever. So these are all loans, again, student's name, no income requirement, no credit check requirement, and they're in the student's name only, okay? So by filling out the FAFSA, the student will automatically qualify for the types of loans that you see here, okay? Most of the students probably listening to this presentation are, are what are considered dependent on the graduate students. Uh, the only issue with these loans is that you'll see that the amounts are not very large, okay? They're really kind of only meant to supplement, you know, or assist, you know, the parent uh, in helping the student out with their college expenses. And they vary by what's called grade level or year. So you see that a freshman or a first year student, the most they can borrow their first year in a student loan in their name only is $5,500. And then that amount increases to 65 and then 7,500 junior and senior year, okay? Uh, so again, they're kind of more meant to supplement. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the, skin ha the student has some skin in the game, you know, here in terms of uh, helping their parents pay for their uh, uh, undergraduate academic expenses. Uh, it doesn't mean you need to borrow them. You know, it's just basically another option that is available to students if they need assistance in, uh, you know, helping uh, with their college expenses. One more thing that I want to point out here is you see here on, uh, you know, let's say the first year of the freshman loan, 5,500, and then it says max $3,500 subsidized. There are two different types of loans 
uh, that the student can qualify for. And the school will make this determination. Uh, one of them is called a subsidized loan, and the other one is called an unsubsidized loan, okay? The subsidized loan means that not only is the principal deferred while the student is in school, but the uh, government is paying for the interest on that loan while the student is in school. Unsubsidized, which would be the difference between the subsidized and the maximum here, so in this case, $2,000, Unsubsidized means, again, principal is deferred, but the interest on the loan becomes due immediately. So the student would either need to choose to make interest-only payments while they're in school, or they can capitalize that interest. The only problem is, is that interest then is accumulating while they are in school, okay? So just keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, any student who is packaged with a loan, they're going to have to go through what's called loan entrance counseling. They're gonna to have to fill out a master promissory note. They're gonna be made aware of their rights and responsibilities as a loan borrower. But this is something that, hey, you know, I wanna learn more about. You could probably do a very simple Google search and, and say, you know, difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loan. And, you know, it'll send you right to the federal website and all of this will be explained. And also a lot of schools also have this on their website too. But just again, keep in mind that this is another option that is gonna be presented uh, to your sons and daughters as they apply uh, uh, for financial aid at different schools. Uh, Mr. Kassane, I do have one question. Sure. Um, are these student loan limits for out-of-state schools as well? Uh, this is, since this is a federal program, this does not matter whether it's for uh, in-state loans or for out-of-state loans, at least not at this level. But that is actually a great question to segue into this slide, okay? Because obviously then now there are loans for the where the student and the parent can borrow, okay? It's just that these are stricter. So now we're getting into credit-based loans. So unlike the federal loan program, which is available to the students only and they qualify for automatically, and there's no credit check on this one, these are loan programs that would require a credit check, okay? And in most cases, we know that the students do not have credit or have poor credit. They haven't established it yet. So in, in some of these situations, you know, they will need either a co-signer, which could be the parent, you know, they could still be the primary borrower, but the parent could be the co-signer. Or uh, like I have in a lot of situations where the parents say, you know what, I'm, I'll let my son and daughter borrow on the, that federal program in their name with no credit check. And then I, anything additional that needs to be borrowed, I will borrow under one of these programs that requires a credit check. But the first program that I want to point out, which kind of leads to that whole in-state, out-of-state thing, is uh, what's called the Parent and Student Can Borrow, and it's called the New Jersey NJ Class Supplemental Loan Program. Now, this is a program that in order to borrow on this program, you must be a New Jersey resident. It doesn't matter whether you're going to be studying in-state or out-of-state, but you have the criteria is that you must be a New Jersey resident in order to borrow on this loan program, okay? Uh, which hopefully, you know, applies to everybody here, but, you know, so, uh, sometimes when you're doing these presentations and you have like a Pennsylvania school on the border that, you know, it's something that we need to point out. Also, the state of New Jersey loan program, a lot of different options that are available to you. I mean, they have options where you can borrow and you can do immediate repayment on that loan. They have options where you can pay just interest on that loan while the student is in school. And they have an option where you can have a full deferral of all payment and interest obligations while the student is in school. And then you begin to repay this loan once the student graduates. Okay, so state of New Jersey, a lot of options there too. Also, the state of New Jersey has different repayment uh, uh, time and rates. So for example, they have a 10-year fixed rate program, which is at 2.9%. Uh, they have a 15-year program at 35 and they have a 20-year a uh, fixed repayment program up to 475. So, I mean, not only do you have these options on either immediate repayment or interest only or full deferrals, but then you can also choose, well, you know, I want to pay it over 10 years to, you know, even though my payments are going to be higher, my interest is going to be lower. I want, I need the comfort of paying it over 20 years, you know, with, even though it's a higher interest rate, but I need that lower uh, monthly payment. Okay. Um, then there's a, a loan that only the parent can borrow. And that one's called the Federal Plus Loan Program. Uh, on that one, it gets even a little stricter. So again, even though it, it is uh, credit-based, repayment on that one begins immediately. 
So unlike the New Jersey program where you have you know, all those different options where you can say, oh, I'll just pay you know, after my son and daughter graduates, on that one, your payment begins immediately. So as soon as you borrow and as soon as that money is dispersed to the college to pay for the uh, first semester's bill, then you know, the federal government will immediately start billing the parent on that one. Again, the only good thing about that one in terms of you know, the repayment option is they do give you up to 25 years uh, to repay on that loan, but you notice now the interest rate starts to creep up, you know, a little bit more. Now they're at 6.28% again, because they're giving you, you know, that 25 year repayment option. They're giving you more time uh, to repay. There's also uh, loans that, again, students and parents can borrow from private educational entities, you know, Sally Mae, Wells Fargo, PNC, you know, TD Bank. Most uh, banks have student loan uh, or educational loan options available uh, to students. Uh, the reason we, you know, we mentioned these, uh, you know, not, not, you know, we don't want to favor the state program versus the federal program. We're not allowed to do that. We're basically telling you this is because we want you to go out there and shop around, you know, uh, perhaps you have a relationship with your bank. You know, you have a bank that you have your mortgage through or you have your line of credit or you have your small business, uh, you know, through a bank. And we tell you, you know what, go out, uh, you know, touch base with that bank and perhaps they're offering, whether it's better repayment options or better interest rates than you know, the state or the federal program can offer. So we would be the first ones to tell you, no, if they're offering you a lower interest rate or a better repayment rate, or perhaps you know, a lower interest, uh, a lower uh, credit score, you know, you've taken a little bit of a hit uh, last year over um, you know, your credit and, and they're willing to lend you money, then we would probably tell you, you know, go with that option, but definitely shop around. But in the end, we just want you to know that there are options available to you uh, when you are making those decisions as to how am I going to afford, you know, uh, this college education for my son and my daughter, you know. And then just note that on these options that have been presented on the slide, uh, that these loans allow you to borrow up to the full year uh, cost of attendance of the college. Okay, so let's say the college costs thirty thousand dollars a year, or forty thousand dollars a year, or fifty thousand dollars a year. These are all loans since they're credit based and they're going to determine whether you, you know, you're, you can handle that debt, that if you need to borrow $50,000 per year over four years, you know, or 50, 50 and 50, you know, that you can do that if you so choose to. Okay, so again, just keep that in mind. You know, that's why we kind of mentioned them last, but, you know, th this option is available to you out there. Next slide I want to go over, which it's part of financial aid, but the financial aid application will not uh, be the determining factor in terms of if you qualify for this funding is merit or talent-based funding, okay? Uh, traditionally for uh, institutional or private scholarship, uh, when it comes to merit or talent-based funding, these are decisions that are made by the admissions office, okay? So traditionally the admissions office controls uh, the merit aid at a school, all right? And that's because they are the ones who are going to be reviewing uh, your sons and daughters' college uh, admissions application. And then based on that admissions application, they're going to be looking at things like, you know, the academics or if that school requires SAT, you know, scores, what the SAT scores were, or if the student got a really high score and decided even though it's optional to submit it, they're going to be looking at that, you know, where the, you know, what kind of, uh, uh, courses that the student took, you know, they took, you know, AP courses, did they take the test, did they gain college credit, you know, their activities, perhaps their academic track, you know, if they went to a specific high school, like a science high school. So they're going to be looking at a lot of these different factors uh, during their admissions cycle. And at the same time that they're determining whether your sons and daughters are going to be admitted at that school, they're also going to be determining whether your son and daughter is going to be awarded any merit-based uh, funds from that school, any institutional merit-based funds, or, you know, let's say in the case of a talent, whether it's an athletic talent at a D1 or a D2 school, you know, or perhaps they're a musician, you know, and they're going to be, uh, you know, uh, going to the music program at that school, you know, a concert pianist, whatever, they're going to be making, the admissions office is going to be making those decisions, okay? Now, what happens is this is uh, this becomes part of financial aid and it's uh, married to financial aid, because what happens is once the admissions office makes 
uh, determination that the student not only has been admitted, but they are also going to receive any sort of merit or talent-based money, they will report that information not only to the student, but to us. And then we would include that uh, that merit money or that talent-based money uh, in the student's financial aid awards or their financial aid package, okay? Now, keep in mind that a lot of schools, what they like to do is, <coughs> excuse me, is after the admissions office has made those determinations of merit or talent-based funding from the school, there are schools that also have institutional need-based awards, okay? Uh, you know, so for example, I'll give you uh, TCNJ, the way we work it here. Once the admissions office uh, makes the determination of any merit funding that the student is gonna qualify for from the institution, they turn those lists over to us and then we have uh, need-based uh, institutional scholarships based on the FAFSA results. Uh, we look at the EFC, we look at the, the profile, and then we would make a determination whether the student would qualify for any additional uh, institutional need-based funding. And that would be on top of any other financial aid, you know, from the state or the federal or whatever that the student qualifies for. And again, then we would put that you know, and include that as part of the package, okay? Uh, not all schools have that, you know, some schools, you know, don't have that additional step, but, you know, we do. And if the student qualifies for merit money, we would also look at to see if the student will qualify for any institutional uh, need-based aid, okay? The applications, and uh, let me stop here. Uh, I'm assuming no questions, Ms. Conway? Okay, perfect. Uh, so the application, so I'm gonna go over three applications with you. Uh, the first application uh, is only for a very small subset of students. The second application is mostly gonna to apply to out-of-state students. And then I'm gonna go over the FAFSA, the one that everybody needs to complete, okay? So the first application I'm gonna go over with you is called the New Jersey Alternative Financial Aid Application. And this is solely for undocumented students. Okay, undocumented students uh, by law are not eligible to receive federal financial aid. Uh, a lot of institutions uh, limit even their school funding to documented students, you know, students here under a permanent status. But the state of New Jersey a few years ago uh, passed legislation to allow for undocumented students uh, who had uh, didn't have those sources available to them, let's say the institution or uh, the federal government to apply for aid to be eligible to apply for certain programs or certain New Jersey state aid programs. Okay, so you see here it's it's a, a separate application. Uh, I put the website if it applies to any of the students uh, that are listening to this application. You can actually just go to hisa.org to apply. Just keep in mind that there are there are still conditions for this, even though it's only for undocumented students. You still needed to have graduated from, um, you know, New Jersey, attended New Jersey high school for three years, graduated, you know, uh, registered for selective service. The students must file an affidavit with the school saying that, you know, they're going to be uh, applying for uh, to legalize their immigration status once they can. And only certain state programs are available to them. Only three state programs are available. So you remember that big chart that I showed you uh, at the very beginning with all the state programs, only three of those are eligible, available to undocumented students. So again, this is a very small subset of students who may or may not be listening, but uh, please keep in mind that although they cannot apply for federal aid and in some cases uh, cannot receive institutional money from the school, they can apply for state of New Jersey uh, financial aid. The next application is called the CSS profile. Now the CSS profile is a private uh, financial aid application that costs money. It is through the College Board. Uh, it is uh, an, a, an application that collects a lot more data than the FAFSA form, which is the one we're going to go over next, okay? There is only one school in New Jersey that requires the profile, and that school is Stevens Institute of Technology. And what the profile is, is it's for institutions that have generous uh, institutional funding that they give out to students. Well, they want this additional application uh, to determine eligibility for their institutional funds only, okay? They wanna make sure that they've, they've scrutinized the families, um, 
you know, household information, expenses, you know, assets, and things like that before they award any institutional funding, okay? So again, keep in mind that really if your sons and daughters are gonna be studying in New Jersey, uh, only Stevens Institute of Technology is the only one that requires it in New Jersey. Uh, no other school in New Jersey requires this form. Uh, students can actually log into the College Board uh, uh, website there, and I put the, uh, the website there, you know, where the students can go in and actually, you know, look up if the college that they're going to be attending requires this additional form, uh, but it's only 400 colleges and organizations uh, nationally, so, it, you know, it, it probably not, you know, more often than not, but mostly it's for students who are going to be studying, you know, out of state who should really be looking as to whether the college, you know, that college requires that this specific form. Uh, basically, it lines up with the FAFSA, you know, so if you have to fill this out, it's available now. It's available October 1 of each year, you know, so the FAFSA is available now. Also, it does ask for more uh, income and asset and household information than the FAFSA does. Uh, and I'll give you some quick examples. For example, uh, FAFSA does not ask any information about your home value, okay? Uh, the profile does, you know, the profile will want to know how much is your home worth, when did you buy it, what your monthly expenses are because perhaps a profile school may want you to borrow on the equity of your home before they give you any institutional funding, okay? Uh, the FAFSA doesn't ask anything about your retirement value and doesn't ask about your pensions, your 401k, your Roth IRA, any of those things. They do not look at that uh, in terms of the, making their determinations for aid, but the profile, uh, depending on the school, may ask you for the retirement value, okay? Because again, they may say, well, you're contributing a lot uh, yearly towards your retirement, you know, you, we need you to ratchet that back and use some of that funding uh, to pay for uh, your son and daughter's college education. Um, Non-custodial parent information. So the FAFSA only requires uh, for, let's say, uh, divorced or separated households, uh, the FAFSA only requires information about the custodial parent, you know, the parent that the student lives with uh, to go on the form. While the profile will ask you for custodial on one, and then they'll ask a separate application for the non-custodial parent, okay? So again, you know, the, the huge, very, three big, very big differences between the FAFSA and the profile, but again, not all colleges use the profile, so just keep, you know, keep that in mind. You really should be checking mostly for the out-of-staters, uh, you know, and again, it costs money, you know, it is $25, uh, and that gives you one college, and then $16, for each additional college, okay? So definitely do your research in terms of if this additional form is required. I do have a question. Sure. Um, if it's, and the question is if a school doesn't require the CSS profile, would they still review it if it's available? But I, it's my understanding that, that you would be sharing it with specifically with that school if they require it, correct? Yeah, correct. If, if the school requires it, then it, the profile information is going to go to that school. The profile information is not going to go to a school that doesn't require it. You know, uh, you know, why would we pull in extra data that we don't need? Okay. All right. And, I've, you know, again, I've given you the website to apply, the website for the non-custodial profile. If you're unsure, if your school uh, that you're uh, applying to requires it, again, mostly for the out-of-staters, you can, you know, uh, there's a customer service number. There is a live chat available. And I would just probably say, you know, go to their, uh, their website and just look up your school and it'll be able to tell you whether they require it or not. Okay. So the FAFSA application. So this is the one that everybody who's listening to me and wants to apply for any sort of financial aid, even student loans is gonna to have to complete, okay? So again, even for student loans, you need to do the FAFSA because there are certain loans that you know, are need-based and some that are not, okay? And even some private banks and private entities, uh, the state of New Jersey being one of them, require that before you borrow on their loan product that the school has a FAFSA on file and that the student has taken advantage of any lower interest loans let's say in their name, before uh, they will uh, let the parent apply for any loan th uh, through the state of New Jersey or even the federal government, okay? So keep that in mind. So this is the one that everybody's gonna have to complete. You fill out the FAFSA at studentaid.gov, um, you know, again, giving you the website uh, right there. Uh, for 22-23, which is basically the seniors that are listening to this presentation, you will be attending college during the 2022-2023 academic year, 
okay, which starts next September, next end of August, beginning of uh, September of 2022, okay? So the FAFSA that you are completing now is for that entire academic year. It's gonna take you from September of 22 all the way until August of 2023. And then again, the following year, you'll need to complete a new FAFSA. The FAFSA uses what's called prior prior year income information. So the FAFSA that you're completing now for the 22-23 year is gonna be using yours if you filed and your parents' 2020 income tax information. So those are the taxes that they already did, the ones that were due this past April, okay? So that information is already out there. It should already be done, okay? Uh, you have an option to use what's called the IRS data retrieval tool, which means that as you're completing the FAFSA, you can either choose to, hey, you know, as I'm completing it, I'm gonna take my parents' tax returns out, I'm gonna go line by line and actually type in the income information, or you can actually log into the IRS website and that information can be transferred into the FAFSA, okay? It's actually the method that we prefer at the college uh, because then we know that the data is accurate. There's been no mistakes. Uh, it's been pulled in automatically. And if God forbid you are selected for an audit, uh, which you know certain percentage of records are randomly selected, then we do not need to request income information from you or your parents because the income information that's transferred over from the IRS is considered valid. You know, it doesn't need to be verified. All right. Uh, there's only two categories of individuals that, uh, uh, sorry, three that cannot uh, transfer information from the IRS. And that would be if you didn't marry filing separately, if you've done an amended return, or if you've done a foreign return. So those can't, but for the most part, that's a, a minute uh, number of individuals. Most people can um, log into the IRS site and transfer that data in, okay? And probably the most important uh, bullet on this slide is you can apply and submit the FAFSA uh, prior to your earliest school deadline. OK, so in other words, you can complete the FAFSA before you even apply at a school. OK, um, even if you're thinking about going to a school, even if it's a dream school, a school you haven't visited yet. OK, you can fill out the FAFSA and put that school on your FAFSA. OK, so the FAFSA allows you to do 10 colleges or universities per submission. OK. So what I mean by that, it means that you can complete the FAFSA, you can put 10 schools, you can submit your FAFSA form. The FAFSA takes about 48 to 72 hours to process. And then at the end of that 48, 72 hour processing period, the student is gonna receive an email with a student aid report basically saying, hey, your FAFSA has been processed. Please verify the information on it you know, for your records, okay? But then that means that the 10 schools that the student put on the FAFSA are gonna have access to that data, okay? If the student then later on decides he wants to add more schools, visits another school and goes, oh, I really like the school, I wanna add them. At any point, they can go in and add new schools on the FAFSA. They can delete the 10 prior ones, put 10 new ones and resubmit. And guess what? In two or three days, the FAFSA is gonna be processed and those 10 additional schools are gonna have access to the data, okay? You could do this a hundred times, okay? And all of those schools that you put on the FAFSA will have access to the data, okay? But as you're gonna learn in the next section, all of those schools are not gonna use the FAFSA data until your sons and daughters are actually admitted at that school, okay? So again, even though you, know, you may not have applied to a school yet, or you're not gonna apply, you know, their deadline's not till February 1, and you're like, all right, I'm not gonna apply until January, I need more time, you know, I'll, you know, they want an extra essay that I need to fill out, you know, do whatever. That doesn't stop you from doing your FAFSA and putting that school on the FAFSA, okay? All it does is it's gonna give that school access to your FAFSA data after you apply and after you've been admitted, okay? So again, probably the most important bullet on this slide, don't wait until you have applied to a school to then do your FAFSA or, or to add that school on your FAFSA, okay? Because the bottom line is, is you just wanna look at all the deadline dates for the schools, all the FAFSA deadline dates separate from admissions, and then make sure that you've done your FAFSA and you've put all your schools by your earliest school deadline. That way you know you've met every other deadline you know, down the road, okay? And Ms. Uh, Mr. Kassane, we do have some questions. Okay, good, 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 I figured. 
Okay. So um, let me just get to, okay. I believe this one you did answer, but I'm gonna just put it again. Um, if this keeps going down. Does the fast rule require the value of the remaining principal on a home mortgage? And if so, where in the form? But I, I believe you said that the FAFSA does not ask about the value of the home, correct? That is correct. Only the CSS profile does ask about that. The FAFSA asks no information about your home. Okay, and another question, does the CSS profile uh, have to be filed yearly like the FAFSA? It depends on the school. So, okay. you know, you, I would recommend that if, if it's a school, they're attending a school that requires the profile, that they check with that school to see if it's a one-time shot to make the determination over the next four years or if they're going to require it every year. And then, um, the deadline for the 2022-23 academic year for the FASPA. That depends on the school. So I could tell you our soft deadline for the 22-23 academic year is February 15th of 2022, okay? Uh, there may be a school that has a December 1 deadline. There may be a school that has an April 1 deadline. There may be a school that says, hey, look, as long as you're not counting on financial aid and you're paying for the bill on your own, you can apply in August if you want. And then if you qualify for something, then we'll reimburse you the money back, you see? But if you are counting on financial aid or at least knowing your financial aid options, by the time decision day comes, which is May 1, you definitely want to make sure that you fill out the staff set as soon as possible. Okay, uh, a couple more. Uh, we already have used the IRS data retrieval to, tool, yet once it is transferred, the FAFSA seems to require more information. Interesting. Well, uh, maybe they can either elaborate more, like what other information they require, or was it more just biographical information, which then that would make sense, you know, just to validate, uh, you know, uh, who they are, you know? Okay. Um, so does my income, well, this is moving too fast. Does my income get put into the FAFSA if I'm divorced with shared but secondary residence? Does my income get put in on the FAFSA? The FAFSA if I am my... divorced with shared but secondary residence? Your, the only, your income is gonna be put in the FAFSA if you're divorced, it should be just your income. So only that should go in there. Uh, and in terms of a secondary residence, that would be under an asset. Okay, so if you own a secondary resident, primary goes nowhere on the FAFSA, a secondary residence goes in under an asset, and then only what your portion of that asset is. So if you only own 50% of, let's say, a vacation rental, uh, then you only put in 50% of the equity on that rental, you see? So, so the income that goes in is just your income of your divorce. Uh, and then the asset would be, you know, split accordingly, depending on what percentage of the asset they own. Okay, uh, they were referring to their uh, the ex having primary custody. So it, it, the student is gonna report the income of the parent who has primary custody. Okay. So then that means that the student is going to fill it out with that parent's information. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, we did the deadline. We did that. And I believe you answered this. If you want uh, the FAFSA, what happens if you want to apply to more than 10 schools? If you can just reiterate that point. Sure. So the FAFSA allows you to do 10 schools per submission. Okay. So you'll have to go in there and on your first submission, you could put 10 schools and you will submit that FAFSA. That FAFSA takes approximately 48 to 72 hours to process. And for all those different entities to get all that data. When it's processed, the student is going to be notified at the same email address they used on the FAFSA. Okay. At that point, the student can look at all the data, make sure it's accurate. They'll see all 10 schools in there. Great. If they want to add new schools, they can log back into their saved FAFSA. They can delete those original 10 schools. They can put 10 new schools and resubmit the FAFSA. 
The first 10 schools will always stay there, okay? But now 10 new schools will be processed and they will receive that FAFSA data. In another 48 to 72 hours, the student will be notified. Guess what? The 10 new schools now have that FAFSA data. The student can continue doing that as long as they like. And I'll take one more. Who qualifies for DVRS college funding? I'm not sure. Um, oh, it, I, I'm assuming that maybe that's Voc Rehab. Uh, that's the only thing I could think of, DVR. Division of Voc Rehab is the only one that I'm familiar with that. Uh, and Voc Rehab, they would need to get in touch with the state in terms of Voc Rehab. And then Voc Rehab would contact usually the student accounts office at the school uh, if okay. they do qualify for funding. Yeah, that's kind of separate from financial aid. Okay, and then one more, uh, can you, uh, wait a second. Where does 529 accounts get entered under the child or parent assets? If right. I have two or more 529 accounts or two or more children, do they all have to be listed? Yeah, so it, the 529 is gonna depend on whose name is it under. If the parent owns the 529 for each of their children, then it's listed as a parent asset. And then the amount of the total 529 for the two kids goes under the parent asset on both FAFSAs, okay? If the 529 is under the student's name, okay, then one student completes the FAFSA and puts it under their asset on that FAFSA, just their portion. And then the other student, the brother or sister, will complete their FAFSA and put their portion as an asset on their end, okay? So again, it depends on whether it's in the parent's name or the student's name. Okay, and then this one, I can answer if they've already applied to a school for early action, they haven't submitted the FAFSA, can we still include that school later? Yes, you can. Perfect. All right. Okay. Well, that was a good flurry, so we'll continue from here. So, all right. Um, so the, the FAFSA, what does it do? So the FAFSA collects the family's personal and financial information and is used to calculate what's called the expected family contribution. You will see that term again in the third section, okay? So we're going to go over that in more detail. Um, you file the FAFSA electronically. You, believe it or not, you can still do it on paper. It's not recommended. It takes about six to eight weeks uh, for them to process it. Uh, so almost, you know, everybody, 99.9 .9 people, you know, do it electronically. I've given you the FAFSA website there. Uh, the student and one parent must create what's called a federal student aid ID or FSA ID, okay? Now, Here's, here's how uh, I'll use this as the example. So if we were doing a paper FAFSA, let's go back to the olden days when we did a paper FAFSA. The student is the individual that's applying for financial aid, but the student will need traditionally the parent's information on that FAFSA. There's certain things that the student will not be able to answer unless the parent can assist them, okay? So if it was a paper FAFSA, the student would sign at the very end of the FAFSA, they would, you know, in ink, and then the parent whose information went on the FAFSA, at least one parent would also sign and then they mail that form. So what happens is, is it's now being done electronically. The student and one parent must create an electronic signature. That electronic signature is called an FSA ID. It used to be called a PIN, okay? And I don't know why they changed it. I think people kind of got PIN more, you know, a bank card, get a PIN, it's four digit number, you know, but they changed it to FSA ID. So the student who is applying uh, for financial aid must apply for an FSA ID. And again, at least one parent in the household whose information is gonna go on the FAFSA must apply for the FSA ID. For the parent, the FSA ID can be used if they have multiple children, but each child who is applying for aid must do their own FAFSA and must have their own FSA ID, okay? Now, what I've done is probably the easiest and most, most simplest way uh, of getting information about the FSA ID. YouTube is a wonderful tool, you know, I love it because it's got a lot of self-help videos. Uh, you know, the Federal Student Aid has a how to create an FSA ID video. It's three minutes and 17 seconds long. It takes you through the screens. It takes you through every steps. I highly recommend that maybe perhaps you, before you even do the FAFSA, go out, uh, on YouTube and go out to the FSA or Federal Student Aid, uh, you know, channel and view things on, view videos on how to create an FSA ID, perhaps FAFSA and FSA ID tips for, for parents, how to fill out a FAFSA. There are even videos, I mean, one's like an hour and something long, that'll actually take you on how to fill out the FAFSA 
step by step by step, every single field on how to create the FAFSA, okay? So again, you know, you're gonna be completing this document. Uh, you're gonna see on the next slide that it's gonna take you a little while to complete the document. So I would say just prepare yourself as best as possible, do a little bit of homework, you know, ahead of time before you go out and complete the FAFSA. And again, YouTube, uh, specifically the federal student aid, uh, you know, videos, because that's the legit source of financial aid. Uh, I, is definitely something that I would highly recommend, okay? But again, just keep in mind that the student and at least one parent is gonna have to create this FSA ID or an electronic signature. Now, just again, general FAFSA information to kind of like mentally prepare you in case you have not done the FAFSA yet. So the FAFSA has 106 questions, okay? <clears throat> so I, I put out a question, you know, to, to the feds, how long does it take to complete the FAFSA, okay? So according to the Department of Education, they told me that it takes a dependent student, which is traditionally what most students listening to this presentation are, approximately 63 minutes on average to complete a new form, and then 41 minutes to complete a renewal every year after, okay? Independents take much less because they're asked a lot less questions. So the reason I tell you this is not to scare you, not to worry you. It's not confusing to fill out a FAFSA, trust me, it's, it's simple. It's just that plan on taking some time to do it. Do not rush through this document. Take your time, okay? Uh, you're gonna find that most of the questions are biographical questions. They're general info or biographical. You know, if you went through it, you're gonna notice, let me see the, the next one. Uh, let me just skip it to one. I mean, you're gonna have, you know, question one is basically your, your title, Mr. Mrs. Ms. Uh, your question two is your first name. Question three is your last name. You know, so most of the questions are just, they're, they're actually gonna become tedious after a while. You're like, really, you know, okay, my date of birth, my social security. So you're, it's just, you know, a bunch of demographic questions and there's gonna be income and asset questions. They're gonna ask all the demographic information about the parents. They're gonna ask about household size, income and assets, you know, federal means tested benefit, the question about the colleges. So you're gonna find that most of the questions are demographic questions, you know? So again, don't fret, but it's just prepare yourself, you know, be ready to take time. Also look, the FAFSA is split up in sections. You can do one section, it automatically saves it. You can log out, you can take a two hour rest and you can come back to that safe FAFSA and pick up at the next section, okay? So again, it's not something that you have to do all at once, all right? Uh, but again, I would just say, you know, set a Sunday aside, a couple hours on a Sunday, get your documents together. Hopefully you looked at some of the YouTube videos about what you'll need and then start filling out the FAFSA. <clears throat> If you get frustrated, you're unsure, take a little bit of a break, and then you can go back to your safe FAFSA, okay? Uh, but again, don't let the, the size, you know, or the number of questions overwhelm you. And it's true, you will find that, you know, the second year when you're, re, you know, doing the renewal or the third year, uh, you know, your completion time is going to become much and much less because you're going to become uh, better at doing it, Okay. Uh, just some general eligibility requirements for the FAFSA, you know, uh, students must have a social security number. Um, the colleges are going to want the student to be enrolled or accepted for enrollment uh, in an eligible program, and they must be pursuing a degree or certificate or other recognized credential. In other words, you know, the, the student must be matriculated, you know, they must apply, they must be accepted, uh, they must be matriculated, and even if they're undeclared, at least they're going for some recognized credential. Uh, again, mentioned this a little bit, uh, you know, at the very beginning, and it's these, you must be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen uh, to receive financial aid, and the mails must be registered with Selective Service. Um, you know, you, you can go to your post office, you can go to selectiveservice.gov, you can uh, do it through the FAFSA, but men, once they turn 18 uh, in the U.S., they must register with Selective Service. That requirement was waived because of COVID for this year. We don't know if it's gonna be waived for next year, but just keep in mind that it is currently a requirement uh, on the FAFSA. Uh, again, went over the two components. When uh, the student completes the FAFSA and they are done, they're gonna receive a congratulation uh, message, you know, like this. Uh, FAFSA was uh, successfully completed. 
Um, they're gonna have unique identifier information up here. Um, in this sense, I'm very old school. And for some reason, this still says print this page. So I guess even the federal government and all its electronic wizardry and doing everything online, uh, they're still putting the print message on here. So I always recommend to everybody print this page. You know, it's going to be basically your official receipt. The FAFSA, you know, does not get lost, you know, or anything like that. But, you know, at least you will always have this, uh, you know, as your kind of like official receipt, even though you're going to get this uh, via email. And also the nice thing about the confirmation page is that it's going to tell you the expected family contribution, which again, we're going to cover in the next section. It's, and it's even going to give you like a little estimated eligibility information for the federal programs here, whether if you qualify for a Pell Grant and how much, and if you qualify for the student loans, uh, how much. Okay, so definitely something that I would uh, recommend you, you keep. Um, additional documents. So if for some reason uh, the federal government needs more information from you, let's say you submitted the FAFSA and it's either rejected or there's something wrong or something unclear, or the school needs more information from you, the school will reach out to the student directly, whether it's on behalf of the federal government or on behalf of the school, the school will reach out to the student directly. I'm going to ask everybody to please mute uh, their uh, cameras or their phones, whatever. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, again, if the federal government or if the school requires any information, the school's going to reach out to the student. Okay. And, you know, I, I've given you kind of like the standard format here that we use here at TCNJ. Traditionally, what we do is uh, we won't reach out to the student until the student has been admitted. You know, being admitted is, is that big key here. Uh, and uh, since uh, until the student kind of becomes our student, you know, they've paid their deposit and made their decision to come to TCNJ. Traditionally, most schools will reach out to the students, uh, you know, via hard copy letter, you know. Uh, you know, some schools will try and use the email that they used, that the student used uh, on the FAFSA, or perhaps once the student is admitted, the student may be given like uh, access to a portal, you know, using the email that they used on their common app. Uh, so some schools may use that mechanism to reach out. Uh, but a lot of schools will still be like, well, you know, the student is still kind of like getting to know us. They're not sure if they're coming here. They will reach out to the student using the, uh, uh, you know, like a hard copy letter sent to their home. Okay. Now, the reason why I even bother mentioning all that, you know, that we're going to reach out to you on behalf of the federal government or the school is because the state of New Jersey, remember the state of New Jersey is receiving this data as well. Okay. So they're going to be sent that information. The state of New Jersey likes to reach out to families directly. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't let the schools reach out to the family. They, you know, they don't rely on the schools to reach out to the family. If the state of New Jersey needs more information from the student in order to process their state aid eligibility, they will reach out to the student directly. So they will email the student directly, again, using the email on the FAFSA. And the state will require that the student create kind of like a, what's called an NJ FAMS portal, kind of like create like a profile, you know, with the state, and they'll be given instructions on how to do it. So, for example, if the state is asking for documentation, they'll say, "Well, you'll need to create this additional portal and and upload documents through that portal." Okay. So, you know, again, I, you know, I mentioned this because again, you're, you're, there's going to come a time when you're probably going to be overwhelmed. You're going to be receiving information from all these different colleges, from different entities, asking you for information. It's it's good to be wary, you know, if you're unsure who's asking me for info, reach out to them. You want to make sure that it is a legit source. But again, just keep in mind that schools will be reaching out to you as well as potentially these entities like the state of New Jersey will be reaching out to you uh, to collect more data from you if they need it in order to be able to process uh, your financial aid awards. Okay. Uh, and, real quick. Mr. Cassandra, yes. regarding so before the I go into the next section, yes, please. Okay, comment. just that specifically, there was a question about the confirmation. Is it going to be emailed to the email address that you provided them? Yeah, so all the information in terms of the FAFSA, like you know, confirmation or even the process FAFSA, is going to be sent to the email address that the student used. You know, uh, at the very beginning of the FAFSA, the student's going to have to put in their email, you know, that they want to be communicated uh, through. So it's going to be put there. What I would recommend highly to students is don't use the school email 
uh, for that, okay? Because remember, once you, you know, graduate, you're, you're a senior, once you graduate, that school email is no longer gonna be valid. So preferably use your own, you know, like a personal email or create an email uh, just for that and make sure that it's an email that you constantly monitor because in some cases it's gonna be the only way that these entities are gonna be able to communicate with the student is through that email. So really students should be getting it. And I can't reiterate this enough to all of the seniors who are listening to this right now. Let me tell you this, because I have a senior at home and he is a pain in the butt in reading his emails, okay? But you should be checking your emails at a minimum twice a week, minimum, minimum, minimum twice a week. You should be opening those emails, checking them out. I know you're gonna be receiving a lot of garbage, but there could be potentially some important information coming through those, those emails, okay? So make sure that you have your own separate email account that is established that you know, is not through the school because that one's gonna go away eventually. And you should be monitoring that email religiously. That is gonna be the only way that we're gonna communicate with you in some cases, okay? So I can't emphasize that enough. So more questions. <laughs> Yes. Uh, one was um, when you when you will the colleges see like the other colleges that you use when you fill out this the CSS profile or the FAFSA will all the colleges be able to get information? I know that's no. something that people no, worry about. Yes. No longer is, is is possible. There used to be a time when you could. No longer is that an option. And then uh, okay, what about the student who has an ITIN? I guess this is a an instead of yeah, the social tax security. ID number. Uh, well, my assumption is, is the student has a TIN number, they are not here under a permanent status and therefore are gonna be limited in terms of the financial aid that's available to them. Uh, probably only state aid is gonna be available to them. Uh, another question is, I know this does often come up, is what if your income last year is significantly different? We're gonna go oh. over that in the fourth section. Okay, so yes. thank you. We're good? We're good. Perfect. All right, so section three, the eight awards. So just, you know, again, a quick summary. So we know that in the first section we went over, we know that that form is gonna be sent to the different entities. You're gonna be evaluated for different types of aid. There are different types of aid, you know, uh, need, merit, combination of both, okay, coming from different sources. In section two, we saw that, you know, we, we pointed out three applications, the FAFSA being the main one, the one that everybody has to complete. But in some cases, in the case of an undocumented student, they will only be eligible to apply for that specific state aid. And in some cases, uh, certain colleges, specifically colleges outside of New Jersey, may ask for that additional profile in determining eligibility for their institutional money only, okay? But all of that basically leads you to this, which is the uh, aid awards, you know, uh, the financial aid package, okay? So, and I'm sure you recall me saying that, you know, um, you can have, you can put a hundred colleges on your FAFSA, okay? But colleges are not gonna do anything with that FAFSA data until the student is admitted at their school. Because there's a lot of work involved in preparing a financial aid package for a student, okay? So therefore, until the student is admitted, they're actually not gonna go out to the federal website, pull in, that FAFSA data and begin to prepare a financial aid package for the student. So in the end, if you put a hundred colleges to have access to your FAFSA data, you only apply to 50 and you only get into 20, you're only gonna get packages from 20, okay? So keep that in mind. That's why it doesn't matter how many colleges you put on the FAFSA, okay? And because in order to establish a financial aid package, there are certain couple of steps that take place. And obviously, you know, I'm oversimplifying it, but I at least want you to understand that there is stuff going on in the background when you apply for financial aid and you're admitted, okay? So the first thing that the colleges do is establish what's called a cost of attendance. This is step one in creating a financial aid award, a financial aid summary, a financial aid package, whichever way you want to call it. Uh, they don't technically want us to call them packages anymore, but I think a lot of people relate to that, that step terminology still, okay? So cost of attendance, step one. So what we do is we establish what's called a budget. We look at how much does it cost? What are all the items that the student may be paying for during their first year of college and every year beyond? 
uh, and we establish what's called a budget or a cost of attendance. And things, you know, the standard things like tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, these are the things that most uh, schools look at. There may be other costs involved. Some of these costs may not come into play until let's say junior year for, you know, let's say a study abroad, you know, oops, sorry, uh, didn't mean to do that. Or, you know, health insurance, you know, a student may opt not to take health insurance. So there's gonna be standard things, there's gonna be non-standard things. But this is the first thing we look at. What's the cost of attendance? That becomes step one. Step two are the FAFSA results. We pull in that FAFSA data. It is run through our computer systems at the college. Uh, and we get that as expected family contribution that is determined by the federal government uh, based on a federal formula that calculates need using the info supplied on the FAFSA. And that EFC is the number used by schools to determine need and a aid eligibility, okay? So this is kind of like what's given to us from the FAFSA results. So that's step two. So let me give you a sample EFC for the Smith family, all right? Uh, so family, uh, Smith families, they, li they live in New Jersey. The parents are married. The household size of, is four with one child going to college. So mom, dad, two children. Their 2020 adjusted gross income was $120,000. Uh, they have $15,000 in assets, and the student had no income in assets uh, for 2020, uh, 2020, so they, you know, reported that, didn't report anything on the FAFSA. So in this situation, the EFC or the family contribution, the amount that the federal government told us that this family can contribute towards the student's first year of college is $21,474, okay? So then once we have that information, we determine what's called need. Okay, and that would be step three in preparing the aid package, okay? So you see here at the very top of the axis, we have the different types of institutions, community college, state college, university, or private college and university. Then we have what I call step one, which is that cost of attendance, establishing the budget. How much does it cost for one year of schooling at that entity? Community college, we know they're relatively inexpensive, uh, you know, room and board usually aren't factored in. Uh, those They don't have those expenses. So we see community college, the cheapest option is 6,000 per year. State college, university, this is my sector. Uh, this is pretty much falls in line with what it costs for one year at school at TCNJ. Uh, and this is factoring in my tuition, fees, room and board. Uh, you wanna add books to this, then you're adding probably another $1,200 for the year. So this kind of falls in line with what uh, my direct or billable costs are going to be. And 50000 probably falls more in line with what a private college or university uh, in New Jersey costs, you know, the Felicians, the Trues, the Centenaries, the Riders, uh, things like that. So that cost of attendance is established, okay? And this is whether you're going in New Jersey or whether you're going, you know, out of state, each college, you know, does this, establish that cost of attendance. Then the next thing is that EFC, that expected family contribution, that is that constant that is based on the FAFSA. And you see that that number stays the same no matter where you go. And this number would stay the same no matter where you go, whether it's out of state, whether, you know, it's this is a federal formula. Okay, whether you're going to college in California or whether you're going to college in New Jersey, this would remain the same. And then what we do is we establish what's called financial need, okay? or does the family have any need? What is our responsibility to try and find uh, the family enough financial aid to cover their need, okay? So we see here that this family can actually contribute more than what it costs to go to community college. So this family has no financial need in a community college. Therefore, the community college has no responsibility to package or find this family any financial aid, okay? If they come to my school, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find enough financial aid for this family to at least meet the $8,526 financial need gap that they have after the cost and after what the federal government determined that they could contribute to that first year of cost, okay? Then here's the private college university. Now, we know the private college university more expensive, you know, so therefore that college or that entity has to find them even more financial aid. Okay. Now here's where I want to point out, look, you know, uh, immediately, if you were to look at this, you would say, well, yeah, obviously it costs a lot less for the student to come to a state school like mine. Okay. 
but I don't have as deep a pocket as some of these private colleges and universities. So you may find, you know, don't do not uh, be afraid or dissuaded from applying to a private college or a more expensive college or university, okay? Because they may be more generous in the amount of institutional funding that they have. They may have deeper pockets, they may have more funding to give out. And they realize that unless they had deeper pockets or give out more funding, most families could not afford, you know, to come to our school, okay? So don't let the higher sticker price, you know, stop you from applying to a private school. Uh, you know, again, I may not have, have as deep as, uh, a deeper pockets, you know, but I also don't have as, you know, as much to give out while this school may, okay? Apply if you really feel the need to, if you really want to go there and then let the financial aid packages come out and see if you then at the end you can afford to attend that school. Okay, I hope I'm getting that message across to you. Okay, uh, don't be afraid. So the bottom line is we're trying to get that financial need. We're trying to establish. And then after all that, in the end, it's to be able to award you any financial aid you qualify for and then be able to notify you as to how much you have qualified for, okay? And send you that award notice, okay? So, you know, this is where it really gets into, you know, uh, you know the, the, the admissions time is like the happy time. Everybody's applying, they're getting their notices, they're getting in, congratulations. It's yeah, you know, it's happy, you know? Uh, financial aid is, oh, you know, now the rubber meets the road. How are we gonna pay for this, okay? So, and, it can be confusing when you're uh, reviewing all of these award notices, okay? So hopefully some small tidbits here for you to take with you, all right? So the award notice. Uh, the format could vary by institution. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, it could be available either in hard copy or online. So some schools still will traditionally send you, let's say a financial aid packet. Okay, you'll get it through the mail. It'll have an official award notice on it. It'll have a lot of glossy information in it, you know, about the breakdown of costs and things like that. That's one way of doing it. Other schools will do it online. What they basically will do is they will notify you that you can log into the portal that was created for you when you were admitted. And you can go in there and you can view your financial aid award summary online, your college financing plan, you can look at your cost of attendance, you know, online. So everything will be done pretty much like we're giving you access. You're going to go out and you're going to look for this information. Up, uh, you're going to look for this on your own. Okay. I can tell you that we do it online and a lot of schools are kind of leaning towards more of that online format, you know, saves money on postage and all that other stuff. But, you know, it, it's just easier and more convenient. And I think more and more students are uh, turned on to that mechanism, that mo modality. Okay. Uh, again, it is available after the FAFSA is filed and the student is accepted. Again, you saw that there is some work involved in the background to create that award package or that notice. So until the student is accepted, okay, the schools are not going to prepare these award notices. And what you should do is you should be looking at the different colleges or universities, uh, specifically the financial aid websites, to see if they specifically post when they send out their financial aid notices, okay? Traditionally, our financial aid notices do not go out until probably end of February, beginning of March, okay? So we could have students that are accepted in December, you know, and they're going, hey, you know, when, when are you gonna tell me? When are you gonna tell me? We'll tell them, look, even though we know you've been accepted, you know, everything's, you know, in line, we will not send our first batch of award notices until March 1st, okay? So, and we have that posted on our website. So keep that in mind. You may want to look to the individual school's website to see when they're going to start notifying uh, students about their financial aid. And obviously the more, most blatant bullet here is it's used to compare aid packages, okay? And that's where, again, it gets a little confusing, okay? So just some things to be aware of when you get these award notices, okay? So the first thing you need to be aware of is any conditions for institutional aid or scholarships. There could also be conditions to federal funding or state funding, but those are more traditional. Those are pretty much, hey, you qualify, and you know, as long as you meet need, you know, you'll apply for next year, and, and and we'll see if you're eligible again. Or there may be a simple GPA requirement, but more of the institutional funding is where you want to look for any conditions. Okay, is there a GPA requirement that you must maintain every academic year? Are there a certain number of credits that you need to take and complete every year to keep? Uh, this funding. 
Is it fixed funding where your first year you were told you were going to qualify for a $40,000 scholarship and it's going to be divided 10,000 over four years. So you're going to get 10, 10, 10, and 10. Or is it going to be reevaluated every year? You're giving me a scholarship now, but then next year you're going to make sure that I have a certain GPA, I've completed a certain number of credits, and I've completed a FAFSA again, and now you're going to tell me if I qualify for the scholarship again. So again, what are the conditions? Traditionally, those conditions should be disclosed when you get your admissions package, at least the merit funding, okay? But any need-based funding will probably be disclosed or any conditions will be disclosed when you receive your financial aid awards, okay? So keep that in mind. Also, will, will outside scholarship impact any institutional funding, okay? So there are schools out there that'll say, look, you're gonna receive $30,000 a year uh, in institutional funding, okay? And that's 30,000 for four over, four, you know, a year for four years. So 30, 30, 30, and 30. But then they say, but if you qualify for any outside funding, let's say Coca-Cola Foundation gives you $5,000 scholarship, then that funding is gonna go and it's gonna, we're gonna decrease our funding and plug that 5,000 in there, okay? So in other words, that school is telling you that no matter what, whether it's from the from our school or whether it's from an outside entity, the most you're gonna get in institutional funding is $30,000 a year, okay? So again, you need to be on the lookout for that. Are there any conditions you know, that impact how much institutional funding I'm gonna get? Also, another thing you need to be on the lookout for is, is the institution front-loading scholarships, okay? They're telling you, well, you are going to be eligible for, excuse me, we're going to ask if everybody can, uh, there you go, thank you. Uh, so, you know, is this, if the school telling you, look, you are going to be eligible for $80,000 over four years, uh, but then when you're packaged, you notice, well, I'm getting, I'm getting 30 the first year. So my aid package looks really good. But then you look at the fine print and you're like, oh, okay. But then that means my second year, I'm going to get 20. So I'm going to have a $10,000 gap that I didn't have first year. And then my third year, I'm getting 10 or my fourth year, I'm getting the other 10, you see. So be on the lookout of how that distribution is being done. Are they being upfront with that distribution? Are they telling you, look, no, you're going to get 80 and it's going to be 20,000 per year divided over four years or it's $80,000 and then you're not being told how it's being distributed and you kind of have to search and go, oh, oh, wait a second. I see that I'm getting 30 from the institution the first year. That means I'm not getting this equally. So I gotta be careful because my package or my aid might look really good the first year, but then I'm gonna have an additional gap that second year, okay? Other things to be on the lookout for, uh, does the school package to need? So in other words, Referring back to that first slide, okay, where you see financial need, is the school just going to say, look, our responsibility in this case is to give you $8,526, and then you're done. You're not going to get anything else above that, okay, or in this case, 28, okay? So, you know, if let's say you would have been eligible for 20000 in need, which would have eaten a little bit into that family contribution, they say, no, you can't get it. You're only going to get up to need. That's our philosophy and you're only getting 8526. So you need to just keep that in mind. This is school package to need only, okay? Uh, nothing more. Does the school package with parent loans, okay? So uh, our example is we only package the student with what he or she qualifies for, whether it's grants, scholarships, uh, you know, merit aid, or student loans, it's only what the student qualifies for. We do not involve the parent in our financial aid awards. If the parent needs, you know, let's say there's a significant gap and they need to borrow or contribute, then that would be up to them to make that determination. And then if they wanna meet with us in terms of evaluating how much they can contribute or how much they can borrow, we would meet with them, okay? Uh, so, but that's the school package of parent loans. Some schools may package with parent loans. They may say, well, yeah, we're gonna package the student with X and, we anticipate that the parent will have to borrow $20,000 a year or $25,000 a year uh, per year for four years uh, in order to help their son and daughter meet their cost of education. So again, you might get an award notice from one school and saying, well, look, they're covering everything here. 
And on the other one, you have a gap. But what you don't realize is, is that on this one, they're packaging the parent with a $30,000 a year loan. While on the other one, there is no parent loan in there. Okay. So again, just look for all those things. And does the school award merit aid or just need-based aid or both? Okay. So again, we award both. You know, if the student qualifies for merit aid from admissions and the need-based aid from the financial aid office, we award both. Uh, but some schools have gotten away from awarding merit aid. They only give need-based aid. And again, it would be need-based aid to meet whatever need the student has. If the student has no need, uh, since they don't award merit-based aid, the school would give the student no financial aid, okay? So again, a lot to consider, and there's, there's probably more, and you know, but I don't wanna confuse you because I know this is already confusing, but I would just say, if you have questions about an aid package or you're unsure, you know, you know read uh, through any conditions. If not, just you know, call the school or email the school and say, hey, look, you know, I just want to be clear here, you know, I got a $10,000 scholarship. Is that renewable? Is it automatically fixed? You know, kind of like just reach out to the school and be sure, because again, you know, at some point you're going to have to make a decision and this is going to drive that decision with this. This is economically feasible uh, for your family. So you want to make sure that you have as much information, you know, up front as possible. Also, I want to point this out. So in New Jersey, <clears throat> So on this one, so you see here, I, I used on this one, the Northern New Mexico College one, because uh, the reason I use it is because it kind of like fit what a lot of colleges do in terms of their award summary. You know, it's just a nice standard award summary. Okay. But uh, in New Jersey, the uh, state of New Jersey requires that we use what's called a federal shopping sheet or a college financing plan, which is kind of like a standardized award notice, okay? I mean, I, I like this, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of schools do like this. Um, the reason I wanna point it out is because in New Jersey, you're gonna get an award notice that looks like this, and potentially you're gonna get an award notice that looks like this, the one on the left-hand side here, okay? So we, we do both, okay, at TC and J. You know, we do an award summary. It's not quite as fancy as this one. So we do both, but we definitely do this one, okay? Um, you know, the reason I like this one is, is because it gives you a, a breakdown of the budget, that cost of attendance. It gives you scholarship uh, eligibility only, grant eligibility only. It tells you net costs after the free money. And then it gives you like, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> loan options, work options, et cetera. Now, again, <clears throat> In New Jersey, this is a requirement. So New Jersey schools, you're gonna get this. Outside New Jersey, it's not a requirement. It's voluntary. So you may find that there may be schools in New, outside New Jersey who use this and this in the other format, but in New Jersey, you're gonna get this format for sure and perhaps another format, which again, unfortunately, it just kind of lends to the confusion sometime, you know? So I would just tell you when that time comes, you know, like when you were preparing the FAFSA, you know, print these out, view them, compare, you know, one school to another. And again, if you have questions, you know, then definitely reach out to the school uh, with any interpretations or something that you may be confused about, okay? And before I hit this section, uh, Ms. Conway, any questions that have come in? <laughs> Just a couple. Um... One, if you completed the FAFSA for more than one student, or if the students complete the FAFSA, does it allow you to copy or save info or do you start over with a second student? I believe each student has to have a, their own FAFSA. You know what? Yeah, each student has to have their own FAFSA, but that's a really good question. There used to be a time when you could duplicate it for siblings, but I'll be honest with you, I haven't done a FAFSA in like three or four years, so I don't know if that option is still available. Uh, I know that for the upcoming, for the following years, you can do a renewal FAFSA, so it'll populate all the previous years, and then you just fix whatever. But about the sibling question, that's a really good question. That's one that you may actually either have to Google or actually go to one of those uh, FSA YouTube videos to see if uh, that's presented as an option. So I'm not sure. I apologize for that. Okay. Um, also, I work at a university where the benefit, one of the benefits is tuition reimbursement. Is that required in the FAFSA or other financial aid applications? <clears throat> no, it is not. Okay. But uh, the individual school may have some kind of requirement or rule 
that requires that you fill out a FAFSA. And then they may say, well, we'll give you the tuition remission, but we wanna see if you qualify for any FAFSA money first before we give you the, the tuition, or we may reduce our tuition remission if you qualify for any FAFSA money. So just, I would say, you know, obviously if you work there, so reach out to HR or financial aid, whoever manages that, just to see what conditions they put uh, on FAFSA filers, you know, FAFSA filing and getting tuition remission. Um, also, is the EFC number the annual amount your family can contribute for the total over four years? Or, or the total of four years. And no, that's, that's, that's the annual amount. And then again, you file a FAFSA each year because that amount may change depending on if the income was impacted or something just changed in the household. Uh, another popular question <clears throat> is, if I know I would not get any financial aid, do I have to fill out the FAFSA? And so in addition, if I don't fill out the FAFSA, will my child's admissions be held back? No, so the FAFSA should have nothing to do you know, with uh, the child's admissions decision. You know, most schools are need blind, okay? So, you know, that won't come into play. But if you are considering having to borrow on a loan, you know, or at least having that option available to you, I mean, you won't know until you get those eight packages or how much it costs, you know. Uh, it, it, you know, I would just say, at least for the first year, file the FAFSA. If you needed to borrow on a loan or there's a cash crunch or, a cash flow issue at the house, everybody's going to require that you have the FAFSA on file in order to borrow on a loan. So you will need that and you don't want to be scrambling that at the last minute. Also, you may not think, you know, oh, you know, I make too much money. I'm not going to be considered uh, for any FAFSA money, but perhaps that institution has a much broader, you know, income guideline in terms of their institutional need-based funding. So you don't want to miss out potentially on any institutional money uh, on the need-based side because you don't want to do the FAFSA or whatever. So I would just definitely say for the first year, just do it. And then after that first year, if you don't need it, or you're going to pay for everything, or, you know, it was a, a futile exercise, you don't have to do it after that. <clears throat> I know that a lot, often uh, when the students check their portals, if with their application documents, sometimes if the FAFSA isn't completed, that'll still say pending. So that also could be why they were asking about the admissions. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but actually, I mean, it, it should not impact their admissions right. decision. All it may say that they're waiting on that, but that's why, because most students, we do encourage most students to do it. Absolutely. Um, do you get the shopping sheet before or after acceptance? Okay, well, remember, you're not gonna get a financial aid package until after acceptance. The shopping sheet, is your financial aid package, okay? So therefore, everything is after acceptance because of the amount of work that's involved in preparing an aid package. Plus, why are schools gonna go through preparing a financial aid package for somebody who has not even been admitted at that school? That makes no sense. So yes, you must be accepted. Uh, can I accept multiple package, multiple colleges, and compare their aid packages before I finalize which college best fits my financial needs? Yeah, well, that's, that's traditionally what's going to happen. If you're applying to 10 colleges and 10 colleges have accepted you, you're going to receive 10 financial aid offers. And then that's what's going to allow you to compare to see which is the one that's an economic fit for you and your family. And then finally, what grade <clears throat> must a student be in to apply for the FAFSA? And that's if your uh, ten, <clears throat> student is uh, intending on attending school the next fall. So it would be during their senior year. Correct, correct. If you're a junior or, or a sophomore, it's too early to apply. That FAFSA is not available for you yet. Okay. okay All right, good. we're good. All right, so the fourth and last section. So uh, you've been a good audience so far. Thank you. Uh, so section four, and this is just basically just other information, you know, just uh, kind of like a, the kitchen bath, you know, kitchen sink where we throw everything that's left, okay? So uh, the application cycle, you know, just be proactive. We always tell everybody be proactive. Really, you should be re just reviewing deadlines right now. You should be, you know, if you haven't applied, you know, already, you know, your Palman app should, you know, have been done or you should be done, you know, all of your, uh, uh, what is it, you know, your recommendations, you know, the email should have gone out already, uh, you know, recommendations for whether it's from teachers or a coach or whatever, you know, those, those should definitely, you know, be on the way. Your essay should be done, you know. Now is the time when you're applying. You're looking at all those deadline dates and you are making sure that, you're either going to meet the deadline or you're going to apply on time, you know, 
Uh, you should be looking at what the financial aid deadlines are. You know, you should be completing your FAFSA. You should be looking at it to see if that profile is required from a school that you're attending out of state, you know, or if it's Stevens, you know, then, then that school. Uh, February through April is when, you know, most schools are sending out those award letters. So again, once you're admitted, you know, when the time comes, you will start to receive all those, your, your financial aid award notifications so that you can compare the different schools and see which one's uh, the best economic fit for you and your family. Traditionally, that's the time also when you may be visiting campus a second time. You may be coming for like an accepted students day presentation. You know, you may be, your parents may be making appointments with the financial aid offices to come in and, and go, look, you know, we got this package, you know, um, of what options do I have as a parent in terms of a loan? You know, how do I go about applying for loans? You know, kind of like solidifying a lot of those plans because by May 1st, I mean, unless you're going to a community college, it's very different. You know, this is more for the four-year school sector. Uh, unless, you know, May 1st is decision day. By May 1st, you know, unless you're an early decision, uh, early action, regular admits, May 1, those deposits are going to be due. And you need to make your decisions, you know, about securing your seat, you know, at that college. Because then, you know, June through August is when you're doing your class schedules, you're going to orientations, you know, you're picking out roommates, you're getting your uh, dorm assignments, you know, those fall bills are going to be due, you know, by the end of August. So you want to make sure that all of that is straightened out by them, you know, so that you can just move in comfortably and start your first semester uh, in college without anything hanging over your head. Special circumstances. Now, I know somebody at the very beginning asked uh, a question about us about this. So we know that the FAFSA for next year for 22-23 is asking for 2020 income information. Um, there are, you know, so you, you have to complete it with 2020 income information no matter what, okay? But there are some acceptable conditions that would allow the financial aid office to, let's say, drop that 2020 income and use what's called projected year income to recalculate eligibility, okay? Those are called special circumstances, all right? And what I've given you here are some of the acceptable conditions at most schools, if not all schools. This does not mean that some schools may have other acceptable conditions for a reevaluation. Uh, I could tell you that the ones you have listed here are the ones that are acceptable at TCNJ, okay? So for example, you know, your parents were working in 2020 and something happened and now they're unemployed, you know, or, you know, they were laid off and furloughed and now they've taken, had a reduction in income. Uh, there's been a disability, you know, uh, you know, dad fell off, you know, ladder at work and, you know, you're on uh, either temporary or permanent disability. Uh, one, mom or dad decided, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm done, you know, COVID did it, you know, I'm retiring. You know, I'm going to go on my pension and my social security, you know, death of a parent, God forbid, you know, there's been a separation or divorce after the FAFSA is filed, because if it's prior to that, you indicate on the FAFSA, you know, your current situation. But if it's after that, and it's at both household, you know, both parent incomes were on the FAFSA, and now it's only one. So these are all acceptable conditions, okay? What I always recommend is, is if you have these, now these are all institution specific, though. Okay, so although you do your FAFSA, you put your 2020 income and you submit it and you put all the schools on that FAFSA, the reevaluations are done specifically by school. Okay, so what I recommend to everybody is, is if they feel they meet one of these conditions, they should be going out to the school's website and looking either for special circumstances or reevaluation processes or appeal of aid process or whatever. Okay, and my school is called special circumstance. Okay, and go to that website and see, you know, what's the process? Are there additional forms that need to be filled out? Uh, you know, additional documentation that needs to be submitted. Okay, now you need to keep this in mind. Okay, most schools will not process a special circumstance until the student has made a commitment to that school. Now, that puts you at a real catch 22. Okay, because you're like, oh boy, am I going to be able to go to this school? I've had the reduction in income, let's say. Am I going to be able to afford to send my son or daughter to that school, you know, without the reevaluation? The school wants you, since the school is not sure if the reevaluation is going to make a difference in your aid eligibility or from the original aid package, 
What they're telling you is, is basically you need to make a decision based on the circumstances as they are now, okay? Great, if you can afford us, you know, the way they are now, that's awesome. Then once you make the commitment, you've had one of these situations, go through our process, we'll do the reevaluation. If it did make a difference, you know, fine, because you already had made your decision, you know, based on the way the situation was, okay? If it makes a, a, a change and now you are eligible for any additional funding, then that's a bonus. Great, now you will be eligible for additional funding and then that'll be reflected in the student's aid package, okay? So I'm hoping that doesn't sound weird. I know it's a bit of a catch-22, but that's pretty much the way most institutions work. And it's because again, in order to do that reevaluation, there's a lot of work involved and a lot of documents that need to be collected. So the school kind of wants to see that you're serious and you've made a decision about going to their school before they go through this whole process, okay? Other resources. And again, this is where, you know, uh, the, probably the, the key phrase in this slide is have a four-year plan. You want to make sure that when you're evaluating your aid packages, that you're making a decision. You know, traditionally, we know that aid packages don't change that much between four years. So we know that the first year's aid package is pretty much a solid one that you can base your next four years on. Uh, but you have to have a four-year plan. This isn't about getting through your first year and then that will make care about second or third year. We'll figure it out then. I could tell you that some schools may, that might be uh, acceptable to them and it's not acceptable for us at TCNJ. We wanna make sure you have a four-year plan, that we are a good economic fit for you for four years, because the last thing we want is for a student or a parent to come to a sophomore summer and say, I'm maxed out on loans. I can't no longer afford to come here. I didn't plan for this adequately. And then now we have no options for you and the student has to withdraw or transfer out of our school. Okay, we don't want that. That is why we have such high graduation and retention rates because we'd rather have the conversation or we think it's best if in, you know, the, the financial aid offices have uh, an honest conversation with you and say, we are not a good economic fit for you. We don't think uh, this is good for you over four years to borrow this much money. <clears throat> then you have to find yourselves in some kind of issue or a hole, you know, your second, third or fourth year, okay? But again, that doesn't mean all is lost. You know, I mean, obviously there are other, you know, options available to you, you know, uh, you know, payment plans are something that uh, sometimes a lot of people forget about or don't realize that colleges offer, but colleges offer payment plans, you know? So as you're looking to budget yourself, you know, you might get some aid, some loans, you know, another one could be, hey, look, you know, can I take the remaining balance due and just, spread it out over 10 months or over 12 months over the academic year to make you know the cash flow easier on my family and be able to send my son and daughter to school. Absolutely. We, you know, we have payment plans. Uh, most colleges have payment plans. Campus employment, you know, uh, whether it's through financial aid or the student just decides to get a job on their own on campus to help defray some of those educational costs. Absolutely. My campus employment budget is probably 10 times what my federal work study budget uh, is for campus employment. So definitely, you know, a job on campus is something that a student should consider. Most schools will limit how, how many hours the student can work, but yes, absolutely help make ends meet or pay for college, absolutely. And then there's specialized campus opportunities and I'll tout the residential advisors one, which is, I think is a real great one, but, you know, uh, upperclassmen who apply and become residential advisors, you know, they're basically, uh, you know, they, they supervise a floor in a, in a dorm room. Uh, they get to live on that for, floor for free, on that dorm for free, and they get a stipend towards their, their meal plan. So right now at, at TCNJ, it's about a $12,000 a year um, uh, uh, value, you know, to become a residential advisor, you know, live for free and get that uh, meal, meal plan stipend in. You know, so when you're looking at a $30,000, $31,000 a year school to have $12,000 immediately taken off your bill because you became a residential advisor, it's a it's huge bonus, a, a huge help for parents in being able to afford college. So again, just, you know, keep some of those outside the box, um, you know, uh, financing options, you know. Uh, private scholarship search, uh, again, and more reason to refer back to the presentation, you have some very reputable uh, college website, I mean, uh, scholarship websites here. Uh, but also I would probably tell you, go out to the specific colleges or universities that you're applying to 
uh, to see if they have a private scholarship link. Uh, I could tell you if you went to the TCNJ one, uh, opened up the outside private scholarship link. I have, we have a 17 page PDF with, you know, three to five different scholarship sources on each page of scholarships that have been vetted by my, by my associate directors. So, you know, I, I would tell you a real good source, but, you know, if you belong to any civic organizations, you know, if you go to church or if you go to, you know, temple or, you know, uh, synagogue, whatever, you know, see if there's any scholarships through your church, you know, see if there's any scholarships through your parents' uh, employers, you know, perhaps they can go to their HR office, they work for a big company and uh, see if they have any, you know, uh, scholarships for uh, dependents of employees there, you know, so in other words, don't leave any stone unturned, you know, go out and research uh, some of these potential opportunities that are out there. And finally, you know, state of New Jersey, uh, we come, you know, even though I work at TCNJ and I do this presentation, uh, I come out on behalf of the state of New Jersey. The state of New Jersey likes to do outreach uh, to different high schools uh, to make them aware that, you know, financial aid is available to students, uh, but they are also there uh, to answer, you know, college questions, financial aid questions. So, you know, you, you know, most, most folks, you know, go to the guidance office at their high school first for questions. But I want you to know that there are, you know, there's a state entity out there uh, that is available for questions if you ever get stuck with something with financial aid or the FAFSA. The federal government also has uh, a number on, on the FAFSA site, you know, if you ever needed uh, questions and things like that. So definitely don't be afraid, but also know that there are resources available to you from, you know, the school to uh, our state entity to the federal government. Uh, you know, in case you ever get stuck or you have questions in regards to financial aid or the application or interpreting an aid package or things like that. So with that, I guess I'll open it up to any, you know, final questions that may have come in through the chat. Uh, if not, Ms. Conway, I'll let you close up and I wish everybody the best of luck. So does anybody have any questions before we go? You can put them in the chat and I can ask Mr. Kassane to answer them. Okay, well, I don't see any questions, but uh, thank you everyone for coming. And also um, remember this is being recorded. So if you wanted to share that with other people, if they weren't able to come, or if you wanted to go back to review it, it will be uh, on our website uh, probably tomorrow. Okay. Perfect, good luck. Thank you and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.